Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Flexport Customs, Unlocking the Benefits of MPF Consolidation. My name is Andrew Phillips, and I'm the Senior Business Development Manager for Customs and Trade Consulting here at Flexport. Been in the industry a little over 10 years. I've worked with some of the largest importers in the United States that import hundreds of thousands of entries a year, as well as some of the smallest importers, somebody that might import one entry a year, one entry every couple of years. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking to you, to you today about merchandise processing fee consolidation. But first, I do have a few housekeeping notes. On your screen, you'll see a sidebar to the right of the main stage. If you're having any technical issues or need assistance during the live webinar, please message us in the help chat and we will reach out to you and try to assist. In the menu on your screen, you also have two tabs. On the first tab, you can register for any of Flexport's upcoming webinars. And on the second tab, there's an option to do a brief survey for today's webinar. We love feedback, so please fill that out uh, before you exit today. Also a note, at the end of today's webinar, we will be hosting a short Q&A session. So please add any questions as we present, and we will be uh, answering those at the end. A little bit of a note there, we will show your name along with the question, so keep that in mind when, when filling it out. Let's go ahead and hit the next slide. So here's the, the fun legal note that we always get to do. So please keep in mind that all the content in this uh, webinar is provided as informational only. Uh, it's not customized to your specific business requirements. Uh, if, you're, if you're interested in reaching out to Flexport, we, we do recommend doing that. We can, we can talk on an individualized basis and tailor this content to you if needed. Perfect. Uh, at this point, I also wanted to introduce my co-speaker, Courtney Oskany. Courtney, do you want to do a brief intro of yourself? Yeah. Hi. Thanks. Um, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. My name is Courtney Oskany. I am the Key Accounts Customs Director here at Flexport. So in charge of all the larger importers with higher volumes or more complex business. Um, but I've spent about 20 years in industry, mainly focused on customs, account management, uh, global trade compliance, all th those types of regulatory roles. Um, and I have also, just as Andrew mentioned, worked with all types of importers, all sizes, all commodities from the small startups to the biggest importers into the US. So pretty broad range and really excited to talk to you guys today about manu uh, manufacturing processing fees and how we can help maybe save you guys some money. Perfect. We'll head to the next slide. This is a brief outline of today's agenda. We're gonna start out super high level. What is merchandise processing fee? What are the benefits of this consolidation program that we've been talking about? Um, also, we're not gonna ignore, there are some risks that come with it. So we're gonna get into that as well. And then how you can mitigate those risks through business rules. And then at the end, we knew that a lot of our, our customers have already told us they want a brief comparison of MPF consolidation to an FTZ. So we're going to do that. And then after that, we'll, we'll run through a recap and then straight into Q&A. All right. So let's get started. What is MPF? So typically, as importers into the U.S., you hear about paying your duties and taxes. So duties are tied to the tariff, and that is what guides what the duty rate is. But the taxes are typically, the most common ones are MPF and HMF. MPF is the merchandise processing fee. It's an ad valorem. You can see the rate there. It's a super fun number. Um, it's a number that percentage actually changes. Customs will, has updated it over the years. Um, and then there's also HMF. That's just applicable to ocean. MPF is actually tied to both air and ocean, all modes of transport. So um, you typically see that on almost every entry that comes into the U.S. is you're paying that additional tax on the goods that you import. It's based on the value of your goods. So whatever your entered value is, that's the percentage uh, you're paying against that percentage. The good piece with MPF is that there's actually a minimum and a maximum. And the maximum is really what we want to talk about today because that's how we can take advantage of it. The way the regulations stipulate is that you can pay those taxes based on the conveyance that's coming in not necessarily just at the entry level. So if you've got multiple bills of ladings, which usually correlates to multiple entries on a conveyance, you're actually able to maximize out that tax and pay it that one time as opposed to paying it on each specific entry. So that's what we're gonna walk through a little bit more today and see if there's any opportunities to do some consolidations on your goods based on 
you know, some additional business rules. I think if we can move to the next slide on who can potentially benefit from this. So a couple of caveats, there are some tariffs or some free trade agreements or some, you know, quirky regulations where you don't actually have to pay the NPF. Obviously we can't mitigate it down if you're not paying it. So initial qualification to benefit from this is that you do actually have to be paying NPF today on your goods that are being imported. Um, as I mentioned on the last slide, the regulations stipulate that it's against the single conveyance. So if you typically put several containers on one vessel and that sails and does the entry at the same time into that same port, that's where we could take a look and see if there's potential to optimize that. The conveyance can be the, you know, an airplane, a vessel, train, however you're moving the goods into the US. The, the basic rules are similar importer, or sorry, same importer on the same vessel and uh, into that same port of entry. So you can't have goods going into New York and then Savannah um, and then potentially Charleston. It has to be into that same port of entry to then file that entry into the port and max out that tax. Um, and then really the other piece of it, since we talked about how this is tied to the entered value of your goods, the combined value has to hit that threshold to max out the tax rate. Otherwise, obviously you're not gonna hit that maximum on the entered value of your goods across those entries. I think Andrew's gonna walk through a consolidation for you guys now. Yeah, exactly. So we kind of hit the basics of how MPF works and, and, and how it's consolidated, but we're gonna show you visually here, how does an entry process look? And Typically what happens is one master bill is manifested and then one entry is filed. So we've got an example up here showing what this looks like. We've got $100,000 worth of shirts, $200,000 worth of pants, $150,000 worth of shoes. And you can see the associated MPF that would be paid for each one of these specific uh, entries. Um, so on the first one, we've got 346, the second 575. The key to that second one is that it's actually, it hit the max. If you use that percentage that we showed you before, you would have paid $692.80. So there's already essentially savings at that entry level. What we're going to get into is once you combine these together, you drop off the MPF that you would have paid for the shoes and the shirt because it's already maxed. And we'll see that in the next slide. Perfect. So what we've done here is just a, a quick visualization Instead of filing each one of one master bill to one entry, you consolidate all three of those entries into a single uh, submission to US Customs. It's the same amount of work for the broker, actually a little bit more, um, but what it's resulted in is a savings of $866 in MPF for the, for the importer of record. And if you think about it, this is three entries throughout the course of a single day. Um, if you extrapolate this over time to what it looks like in a week or a year or a month, um, you can see that that number could get a lot bigger. And realistically, the savings that you could see from MPF, and I've seen this for some of the importers I've worked with, can be hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars. And it gets very sticky, right? Like if your broker can't do this for you, uh, this could be essentially, this could be a savings of more than you're paying them. So it's really important to make sure that that's still happening. Now you can briefly see, you know, Everything goes together, there's a, there's, a, there's a pro, but what kind of risks might come out of grouping entries together? And this I'm probably leading you here because it's probably clear to some that are on the call, but we'll get into some of those specific risks. So the first one, the explicit risk is if you had one of those entries and you've got the shirts, the, the pants and the shoes that I had before, if the shoes were gonna be flagged for exam, and all three of them have been combined together, together, all three of those entries are now on hold. Um, so that is the, the major risk is there might be the potential for everything going on hold and then you having to pay storage for everything, exam fees for everything, detention for everything. So it is a complicated risk that you have to account for. There's also a potential or opportunity risk that exists. So if that t-shirt entry was notified to the broker seven days before arrival, the, the pants was notified the day of arrival and the shoes were notified three days after arrival, the broker wouldn't have had the opportunity or the planning time to group all three of these entries together. So the timing that you notify your broker is also a risk. You know, if you're in the habit of notifying your broker day of that it arrives at port, 
that can be difficult for them to do um, the planning needed to, to implement an MPF savings program, um, which can make it hard for error type entries, for example, but not impossible. Um, it's something that I've seen successfully implemented uh, and there are ways to work through those. Yeah, sort of as with everything in the world of customs, the further upstream we have visibility, the better off we're going to be, regardless of we're looking for classification or additional details to file your entry, having that visibility further upstream to ensure that we can do the consolidations, because we're still, as a broker, we're still preparing your entry the same way we normally would, but then once we can see that, hey, well, these entries are coming in, they're all in the same vessel, they're all going to be filed into New York, we can go ahead and do a consolidation and, and submit them as one unified entry over to customs. We need to have that upstream visibility so that we make sure that we, you know, ensure that the tracking, they're, they're all in that same vessel and we're able to submit them all at the same time. So as with everything, just more visibility and having those details upstream is just really advantageous to your broker. Perfect. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead and go into business rules as well. So, so there's risks that are out there, but there are some mitigation strategies that you can use to reduce those risks. And that we put a couple of examples up on the screen for you. There are many, many more that can also be out there, but some these are some of the big ones and I think they help to paint the picture. So there are higher risk products and commodities that are out there. If you're importing flour from Colombia, you probably have a higher risk of seeing an exam for that product. Um, so you might not want to include your flour imports from Colombia with your t-shirt imports from Colombia. You probably want to keep those separate. Um, if you're only importing flour and you've got five entries of flour, maybe you would want to group them together because they're all at the same level of risk. Um, but aside from the specific commodities, you can also look at what is your exam rate specifically for a product that you're importing. Um, we've seen some importers that want to exclude you know, specific PGAs from entry consolidation. So don't include any entry that, that includes fish and wildlife into a grouping because we know that those take longer, the potential for risks. Some clients don't want specific types of FDA or specific HTS codes. Um, they don't want specific manufacturers that they know have higher risk. So you can, you can build some of these out based off your risk tolerance and then figure out how can these business rules be applied to the entries that you're doing. Yeah. Um, the other piece that you want the broker to keep in mind is don't group, um, don't group the entries together unless you're going to save a minimum amount of money, right? So don't group those three entries together if you're not going to have any savings. If they were all below the threshold, you've just added risk to the, to the entry without getting any benefit. Um, I've seen importers say, you know, don't group it together if, unless I save $50 or $100 or $200 at an entry level. And that's something that, that can be programmed and, and built into a process. Um, the other piece that I've seen that can get a little more complex is don't group more than a certain number of containers together. So in that example that we had shirts, shoes, and t-shirts, maybe it's, you know, the shirts and the shoes are two containers each, but um, the, sh the other product is 10 containers worth of that product. You might not want to group all three of them together. You can still have savings if you just grouped two out of the three products together. The savings isn't as much, but you did mitigate some of the risk. So there is a cost benefit analysis that you want to work through with your broker to see, okay, let's mitigate some of the risk and not include more than 10 containers on a single conveyance or a single entry that we've grouped. Yeah, and I think that goes back to knowing your business. If you know that you guys always have that certain commodity out of a certain origin or it's just a certain product that always gets flagged for exam or it gets held, we would never want to loop that in. So that should be a business rule. And we always exclude that from filing those entries. And we've probably all got our examples, but I always had an importer that the, they brought in tile, but the color of the tile was almond and customs would always flag it thinking it was going to get, you know, it was actual almond food product, even though it was tile flooring or whatever, but we knew those were always going to get put on hold. So you would never want to loop those in because your risk of jeopardizing that entire entry is obviously a lot higher. Yep. Let's go ahead and get into, we want to do a brief entry consolidation to FTZ comparison. So we'll get to this next slide here. Perfect. Um, some of the call outs, or Courtney, I think you're going to take this one actually. So, okay. go for it. yeah, we, I know we can both talk to this guy, but yeah. this is a fun one. I think Andrew and I get these types of questions a lot because I, I guess in my mind, 
you know, MPF consolidation is a program that's been around for a long time, but I don't know that it gets as much PR as, you know, FTZ. I think FTZs and foreign trade zones are a little bit more of a buzzword and they're more known in industry as a way to mitigate your duties and taxes. Um, but they're definitely not for everybody. Um, you know, the difference with MPF versus an FTZ, FTZ is a physical, it's a location, right? You have to actually physically stand up a warehouse. You have to have that overhead, that physical investment. You need to have all of those permitting licenses, approvals from customs. Um, there's software required to do, you know, the 214s and the withdrawals. Um, it, it's just, it's a lot of undertaking sort of rule of thumb that I've always worked off of is if you're not going to potentially save at least $250,000 a year, the overhead on a zone is, is really not going to be worth it. Right. It's just so much management and oversight um, to run that operation, especially if you're not doing manufacturing or transformative work, if you're really doing it just to save on the taxes, it's a huge amount of investment um, just to try to defer those taxes. Whereas with MPF consolidation, it's very minimal lift on the importer. It, it really puts more of the work on your broker, which is fine. We're happy to do that. Um, but there's no, you know, it's not a physical location. You don't have to get the approval from custom. It's something we could turn on and enable essentially tomorrow. Once we go through just a quick assessment on business rules and how you want us to manage those entries for you. There's no software. It's not a different type of entry. It's still your standard 0102 consumption entries. Um, and it does allow you to get any of that MPF that's on that conveyance grouped in and mitigated down to that one maximum fee as opposed to, you know, the iter of taxes. So um, there is definitely a space for free uh, foreign trade zones and they have, you know, a huge amount of benefit for the right importer, but they're not for everyone and they do have a ton of work that goes into them. So we love to be able to offer MPF consolidation as an alternative to save on those taxes without all of that investment into the zone. Yeah, and I, I'd also like to call out that they're not mutually exclusive, right? So yeah. maybe you have an FTZ in New York, but you also import to LA. So you can continue to run your, your entries through that zone to, to New York, but you can utilize MPF in LA. And it's not as limiting because to a specific location. If all of a sudden you decide that you've got a project and you need to run 10 entries through Seattle or 15 containers, you yeah. can say, okay, let's group these together and we're still going to see the savings. So it is something that can be paired together and you still get some of the benefits. Um, and, and so you could, you could make them both work at the same time. And, and it's something to keep in mind. All right. So quick recap on, you know, really the benefits for you as an importer to try to use MPF consolidations on your entries is, you know, as we've been discussing, it's really the cost savings. It's, you know, depending on what your entered value is, uh, the importer can end up saving so much money by doing, you know, the MPF entry consolidation. You pay the tax once instead of multiple times, depending on how much volume you're moving on the vessel or the airplane. Um, so obviously we want to try to bring cost saving initiatives to everybody. I know oftentimes the uh, customs or compliance department at a company is really viewed as an expense, not a revenue generator. So it's really fantastic when we get to go to importers and say, we can save you money. You're able to turn around and tell your senior management that, hey, we're able to defer some of these costs, you know, and not be seen as just an expense center, but also, you know, an expense mitigator as well, which is fantastic. Um, it's really low lift for the importer. As we've been discussing, it, it's mostly the work that the broker will do to go ahead and transmit all those entries into one consolidated grouping. Um, we really just want to understand your business, your business rules, what your risk thresholds are. And that takes a little bit of research and conversation, but it, it's, you know, there's no extra work really for the importer on how to have, how to do these entries, you know, the way it would be with a free trade, a foreign trade zone. And then there's no implementation costs. So even if you were to turn off a zone or use, you know, volume into a different port, you would still be able to do this. There's no implementation. It's not an approval with customs. It's something we can start doing for anybody, you know, once they're ready to move forward with this initiative and start saving some money. Perfect. We've hit it. We've hit all of the content at a super high level. And so we want to move into a Q&A here. Um, just a reminder, the Q&A section is directly on the screen, and we will go ahead and start showing these questions and answering them. All right. So our first question um, is that the MPF Max actually is about to be updated, um, effective 10-1. Is that correct? I believe that I just saw that. And the answer to that is yes. On the Federal Register back in July, they are changing the ranges up to 3167 for the minimum and 61435 is the maximum. 
Yeah, I think a call out that I would want to make here is that MPF for a long time was $485. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a number that's stuck into my head because I saw it so many times. Um, there was a bill passed a number of years ago that now ties the MPF fee to inflation. So the number goes up every year and what it is that you could potentially save. Um, and so the numbers do change and that's why they're also not round. You know, it's, it's going from 575 to 614. It's like, where do they come up with these numbers? And it's all based off of those inflation adjustments that they make. Yeah. The next question we have is from Kim Supik. Uh, and it says, is it possible to do a consolidation release on containers that CBP did not hold? So I'm thinking here that you're talking about, like, does every one of these go on hold? Or is it that, you know, some, something's already been on hold? Um, I do want to say that I've seen entries in the past that, you know, five containers, 10 containers were grouped together. They're submitted to U.S. Customs. You, I have picked up the phone before. I've called Customs. I've asked them what specific commodity is it that you want to see? How does this work? Uh, and then I've asked them to conditionally release the other goods. So, you know, I've, I've got, I'll go back to that t-shirt, shoes, and, and pants situation. They'll say, okay, the shoes are on exam, but I'll conditionally release the other ones. It's not a guarantee that U.S. Customs will do that, but it is something that's within the capability. And if you've got a good broker, they're going to advocate for you and, and reach out to U.S. Customs to get that release. Um, so yes, if, if all of the products go on hold, there is a possibility. I don't want to say that it's going to work every time. Um, it's really dependent on the customs officer that's, that's, that's performing that exam. All right. Next question is from Blake Mueller. And are MPF fees refunded via duty drawback? Um, and to be honest, I don't actually know that question. And I apologize. Andrew, do you know that one? I do. Yeah. So they are, um, okay. you can recover. MPF. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they are. Um, so you can recover MPF via duty drawback program. And, and just for everybody, a duty drawback program is you import a product to the United States and then export it uh, or destroy it. There's, there's a number of other nuances in there as well, but you can go back to U.S. Customs and ask for the duties, tax and fees that you've imported back. Uh, and MPF is one of those fees that qualify. Thanks, Andrew. The next one we have is from Morgan Cummings. She says, can you take advantage of MPF if you ship in bond? So the answer to this is a little bit nuanced. If you're shipping, uh, the, the way that I think about it, so we talked about the different conveyances that exist out there. It's air, ocean, it's rail. Um, the, they have to be arriving to the same place at the same time. So if you've got something that's moving in bond from LA and it's going to go to Chicago and you've got three master bills loaded on one train, those three master bills could be combined into a single entry and you can, you could mit mitigate your MPF. If you're moving something, if you're moving via truck, right, and you've got five containers arriving to a port and you're moving it in bond to another facility, as long as all of those master bills are coming to the same facility for the same import at the same time, there is potential to group them together. Um, but I would want to know exactly, you know, what your in bond movements look like to kind of analyze those and, and take a look and be hundred percent sure, but generally I would say there is a potential and an opportunity. Yeah. And with that, you know, often the vessel would terminate in LA and then you might send some cargo to multiple inland ports. It might make sense then to re-examine that cargo and see if it's better to have all of it clear in LA and then not move in bond just so that you would then be able to take advantage of more savings if all of it's coming in on that same vessel. So I think that's one of the converse, that type of a conversation is something you would do when you're looking at the business rules, figuring out what makes sense, how much you can consolidate, making sure you're really optimizing these savings. All right, so the next question is from Navin Nathan. Sorry, I arrived late, but do you have to have multiple shipments arriving at the same place at the same time on the same vessel, cargo ship or plane? Also, what is the maximum period that a single MPF can encompass? So, um, to talk through this, uh, you know, you do need to have multiple entries because otherwise if it was all of your goods were going in on the one entry, it would go ahead and max out on that specific entry. But if you're moving multiple bills of lading 
on the one vessel or the one airplane, then you would want to go ahead and push those together into that same entry. And that way you'd only pay that maxed out tax the one time, right? So you do have to have multiple because that, that's really the logic behind this. Um, but as far as the maximum period, it would really be anything that's coming in on that specific conveyance. So you're not going to be able to group the next sailing or a different port of entry. It has to really be at that single moment in time, but you're able to consolidate as much as you want that comes in. So if you're an importer moving 50 containers on a vessel, we can either do that as one consolidated entry, or we could break it down and do five consolidations of 10 per uh, you know, entry. That way you're not potentially putting so many containers on and risking that they all get held. Um, but we can absolutely configure those as business rules when we're looking over this. Yeah, yeah. In summary, it's it's on a single date on a single vessel. Yep. If you had two vessels arriving on, to the same port on the same date, you couldn't combine the two vessels together. Um, it's still got to be one per vessel. So um, the, the key there is it's on a specific conveyance, which is one date, one 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 vessel, one import of record. Yeah. All right. Next question is from Darcy White Knight. Is this mainly beneficial for lower value shipments? Will this apply to high value? Um, so I actually think it's more beneficial to high value goods because you have a higher chance of hitting that maximum on an entry. So if you've got several entries that are all very, very low value coming in, you might not even be hitting that maximum threshold you might, if there are a couple of them are consolidated. But you know, as Andrew was mentioning earlier, if you combine several together and it's not really saving you any money because you haven't maxed out that tax, it might not actually be worth the risk of doing the consolidation. However, if you have several entries that are hitting that threshold, you know, four or five entries that are all hitting that maximum, absolutely. If you can save four out of the five, that, that makes so much sense. So I think uh, it's worth looking at what the value of the goods are. I think it is actually more applicable to higher value because you have a better chance of maxing out that tax and optimizing your savings. Um, but that doesn't mean that lower value shipments wouldn't also have, you know, a chance of benefiting from this initiative as well. Yeah. And to be super explicit, to save MPF when grouping, the combined grouping enter value needs to be between $160,000 and $175,000. If the total combined value is not above that threshold, there's not a potential for, for saving. The next one we've got is from Tracy Pritchard. Um, her question is, is there a way to denote which shipments are util utilizing MPF on the Flexport portal? Um, yes, there is. So we essentially, in our system, will have a pre-file and a master file. The pre-file is gonna have the duties, tax, and fees at the line level like you're used to seeing. And then we will denote on the entry that was combined that this was the, the grouped MPF consolidation we can do that in a naming convention or in a shipment tag. Um, but we can work with you individually if, if you've got specific questions on how we would represent that to you. All right. The next question is from Megan Zabrowski. Uh, I have parcel shipments that are high in value. Is it possible to perform consolidated entries for multiple UPS parcel shipments that are arriving into the same port? Um, so I don't want to speak for UPS on their capabilities of doing this, but the fundamentally being able to combine multiple entries that are moving in via a plane is also possible. So I think that is a best, the question would be best to ask your broker and see if they have this functionality um, and how they would handle it on small packs. I know it's definitely a little bit different when you're doing the parcel goods um, than freight, but um, the regulation is really just on the conveyance. So the ability to do this is there for sure. The next question we have is from Paula Tumi. Her question is, how many BLs can be combined? Um, there's, not a, there's not a maximum number of how many. It's really just a, the amount of risk you're willing to take on. I have had importers that have put 100 plus master bills into a single entry and filed it. They go through without an exam and they've saved significant amount of money on a single conveyance. That really helps when you're a large importer, but I have never, you know, there's not a limit that U.S. Customs is going to hit unless you're going to hit the maximum number of lines that's allowable to be submitted to customs, which is 999 individual line items uh, or tariff items. So those can be grouped as well. That's the one limiting factor. But aside from the number of master bills, there's not a maximum that you can combine. All right. Our next question, I believe. Oh, 
was about to skip one. Sorry. So the next one is from Ray Muratori. Is there a certain number of product types that make the strategy more or less effective? I.e., does this work better with many product types or fewer product types? So I don't necessarily think it has an impact on product, uh, potentially on the commodity though. So what I would say is if you're able to keep like commodities together, especially if they're low risk for being flagged for an exam, that is just a lower risk. The, the MPF consolidation program doesn't actually have any impact for different types of co commodity or product or any of that. That's relatively irrelevant for customs. But our thought on this is that if there is, you know, goods that are going to get flagged, we don't want to lump those in. So I think it makes sense to keep your t-shirts together and then, you know, your other products together, or maybe never do a consolidation on something that's going to go on to some sort of an ag hold or pharma, any of those products that are a little bit more high risk for, you know, inspection. Um, but the product itself really doesn't matter with this initiative. It's just more about, you know, the freight that's moving at the same time on that same vessel and then ensuring that we don't put anything into a consolidation that could potentially hold up the entire consolidation because it is a targeted, you know, commodity or cargo from a specific origin. Um, all right. And then our next um, question, I think, is sort of along the same lines. It's from Debbie, Debbie Bittemer. And what is the reason these would be more likely to be held by customs? Um, my personal perception, I'll ask Andrew for his opinion as well, is I don't actually think these are more likely to be held. Customs isn't really going to see this. They're going to see one entry with a couple of bill of ladings on it, several containers. That doesn't necessarily cause customs to target it. It really goes into what is, you know, the same reasons customs targets anything. So the importer of record, country of origin, potentially the manufacturer, right? When we look at the MIDs and we know that certain suppliers have maybe been doing things they weren't supposed to be doing. So now they're on you know, the target list for customs and those specific commodities. So the specific consolidations themselves, I don't think are at a higher risk of getting held or targeted or looked at, but the specific commodities on those entries are potentially, you know, at risk the same way they would be in any other targeting uh, by customs or the PGAs. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we all know there are targeting practices that U.S. Customs does looking at those key points that Courtney just called out. But then there's also just a certain number of random exams that happen. So, you know, is this, is, an, is a combined entry any more likely to be held than a non-combined entry? I, I don't know that, I think that the, the risk there is negligible. The only key differentiator is, you know, if you're importing 10 of the same products individually or 10 of the same products together, it's not gonna add any risk. But if you do have a diverse commodity mix, that's where it slightly in increases your risk because you know, maybe they're they're focusing on shirts from China right now, and you group that together with your bicycle parts. You know, those type types of things because you have a diversity of products, they might be targeting each one of those, and so you've you've up the categories that they might be looking into. Thanks, Andrew. Yeah. The next one is from Ryan. Uh, his question is, how can we verify we are optimizing HTS codes and any best practices on classifying at HTS codes? So I think this service is a little different than MPF, right? So classification of goods can be done by a broker, it can be done by a consultant, it can be done by the importer. Um, and it is probably fit for another uh, webinar that, that maybe Flexbar will be hosting in the future. But optimizing classification codes and, and doing some of that stuff is something you're going to do in your calculation as to looking at risk and, and the, the enter value and some of those things to see how much you can save. But, um, you know, we, we could probably save that topic for another time and, and get into that there. Yeah. And we have a trade advisory group at Flexport run by Jen Park and she and her team do a fantastic job at supporting classification initiatives. So if you do need some support with how to classify your goods, um, they are absolutely available. We can connect you with them and they do a terrific job. Um, and the other piece just to call out with this is that the specific tariff rate on the commodities doesn't drive your tax levels for MPF. So the tax is a specific rate, as we mentioned earlier, and it is tied directly to your entered value. It is not impacted by the tariff unless the tariff is one of the HTSs that has an exclusion and you don't pay you know, MPF on that because there's a free trade agreement or, you know, a SPI in place or something like that. So um, the 
tariff and the classification we can absolutely support. I'm happy to help there, um, but it, it doesn't necessarily have the direct impact on MPF. Perfect. I'll take this next one. It says, can Flexport pre-check the data in advance and group only master bills of lading with complete data? So I think this is when, when I was talking about the risks that are out there. Um, we are only going to submit the entries that we've been notified of in advance of, 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 it, of it arriving. We essentially, the way that it operationally works from a brokerage perspective is we're going to go ahead and fill out the customs declaration for each master bill that's out there. And then once we see what the value is and what the MPF is calculated for that product, whether or not it's got FTA, whether or not it's got you know, any, any risks that you might've tried to mitigate your business rules, only at that point do we group it. So it's done after each of the master bills has already been prepared for customs, but we haven't yet submitted them. And the step that the broker does before submitting them is we choose those specific entries in our system, we hit a button and it combines them together and then submits them to get to customs all at once. Um, but that is how we, we manage it. And so, yes, we could say, you know, it's not going to save NPF for these five entries or we're not going to want to group that product because it has FTA. All of those key data points are visible to us because the entries, the each end of what would have been the individual entries are all prepared and we can we can make those those business decisions and justifications. Yeah. And I see we have a follow-up question to one of the ones from earlier from Megan, um, where she said she wants to clarify her earlier question on the UPS parcel that we utilize broker turnover to Flexport. In this case, could we consolidate our UPS parcel entries? Um, so Megan, with that, the ability to consolidate those entries and have our team do those is absolutely there. It's also, though, going to be very contingent on UPS getting that information far enough out to do the consolidations. So um, those of you that have been in industry for a little bit probably know with dock turnovers, there can be a delay. We can, especially in air freight, we can sometimes get those turnovers after the cargo has arrived, um, potentially trying to just get those entries cleared really quick so that, you know, we're not selling the cargo to you guys as the importers. Um, as long as we have the upstream visibility and we know that these entries are coming and we're able to prepare them and then do the consolidation really all at the same time, it shouldn't be an issue. Um, what, will, what potentially could happen though, is if you've got multiple shipments on that one, uh, UPS flight is if they, you know, get us a couple of them. And then we find out after the fact that there's another one, we would have missed that one. It's not going to be able to be lumped in. We can't go back in and add it. Um, so I, I want to say yes, but I also think we should take a look at this and just make sure that we really can actually execute on it because I would hate to commit to being able to do this. And then we have some, um, you know, some hurdles just with it being a doc turnover mode, but um, I am happy to, you know, circle back around and see if we can't support this on your specific imports and see how we can help with this. And maybe we work with UPS to get visibility further upstream, or if we're able to get information from your shippers further upstream, just so that we know this cargo is coming and we can go ahead and do that prep work in advance of the cargo arriving. That way we'll be able to submit all of them as one entry. Yeah. I, I think this is one other area that you, we could build a custom business rule. So, you know, like typically we file entry as soon as the airplane's got its wheels up and it's taken off, we could change your, your entry timing KPI that we're, we're only going to file within five hours of, of the shipments arrived instead of when it's taken off, or we can do it within 24 hours of its arrive so that there is a better opportunity to capture some, some potential late turnovers from UPS. Um, I'd want to dive deeper into some of those specifics, but um, I do think that we could find a specific business case where it could work. Agreed. I think that was our last question, unless there's any. Yep, I think that that's it. That's gonna conclude our webinar today. Um, thank you everyone in the audience for attending. If you'd like to reach out to our customs team or you'd like to hear about Flexport Customs, please reach out to customsbd, that's boydog at flexport.com. It's, it's for business development, which is the team I work on. Um, and then as a reminder, please also fill out the survey before exiting. Uh, thank you and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.